comes up, no one can do good, question mark. All right, let's see what this has to say. Good deeds are worthless as a filthy rag in the sight of God, not because the motive of the doer is necessarily wrong, but because the debt of sin owed is too great to be overlooked on account of such deeds. Stop right there. Leighton, you can stand on your head, you can wear a pink tutu and spin in circles. You are a Pelagian. You, you may be so averse to the description that you just simply can't hear it, but the reason our works are as filthy rags is because of the imperfections of our motivations and our fallen nature. Not because the debt of sin owed is too great to be overlooked on account of such deeds. That's a completely different issue. You are completely changing the historic, yes, even the historic Baptist understanding of the corruption of the human soul. You are, sir. If you can't hear that, Listen to, would someone in Leighton's life please come along that he trusts and warn him he is on the road to Jesse Morellville. He really is. If people just keep pushing him to be consistent with what he's said in the past, he's going to continue down this road. Good, good deeds why does it say that our, our, our deeds are filthy rags before the Lord? Because of the, of the debt, the amount of debt? What if we had less debt? Are they less filthy? No. We are fallen in Adam. And so all of our motivations are self-centered. We cannot do that which is pleasing in the sight of God. Romans chapter 8. So you see a complete category shift in the first sentence of the article. So you're being told that your good deeds are worthless as a filthy rag. See, worthless and filthy rag are two different things. Worthlessness in undoing the debt of sin is one thing. And we're not talking this type of thing. Sin has to be atoned for. That's the, that's, this is what the law t teaches us. Filthy rag, menstrual rag is what it literally is in Isaiah, is due to the motivations and nature of the doer of the works. He continues, no deed, even if motivated by a genuine faith and selflessness, can pay off our debt of sin. Is, are we talking about an unregenerate person or a regenerate person? Because in Leighton Flowers' world, there isn't much of a difference between the two. Only the blood of Christ wipes away our sin, and God graciously chooses to bestow the righteousness of his Son to whosoever trusts in him. And it's always based upon human faith. That is the ultimate determining factor for Leighton Flowers, for David Allen. When we get around to doing the, and it's going to take a while because it was a lengthy series, response to David Allen's three-part uh, blog posts, we will see, again, the provisionist, traditionalist um, elevation, the primary initiatory element of, of the ordo salutis in their perspective is the autonomous act of the human will. There's no, no question about it. None. None. Therefore, the Bible isn't attempting to say that no one can do a genuinely selfless deed motivated by sincere faith in God. The Bible is only saying that even these good and faithful deeds are worthless apart from the provision of Christ on Calvary. 
The Apostle Paul taught, there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God, Romans 3.11. In an effort to demonstrate that all people have fallen short of the glory of God and broken his law, Paul quotes from Psalm 14, 2 through 3, which says, The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. There are basically two theological approaches for interpreting this passage. Now, be, I have said for a long, long time that Leighton Flowers and I have completely different definitions of the term exegesis. He believes exegesis is dealing with the text so as to leave open as many possibilities as possible. And I believe that the very word means to bring out the meaning of the text. Not to say, well, it's not saying this, and it's not saying that. That may be an element, but is insufficient to be the core of what actual exegesis is. So we are told that there are two ways of looking at this, the Calvinistic approach and the non-Calvinistic provisionist approach. Um, so the Calvinistic approach, apart from a divine irresistible work of regeneration by which God changes a chosen individual's nature and desires, that is, and I'm providing this, raises you from spiritual death to spiritual life and does give you a new nature, yes, my, mankind cannot willingly seek to know, understand, or follow God. Or, more properly, for someone who claims to be have been a former Calvinist, though there are a lot of people who knew him back then that say, no way, um, the reason mankind cannot willingly seek to know, understand, or follow God is because man's desires are centered upon the self. So you have a rebel sinner who is intent upon remaining in his or her rebellion against God. Number two, the non-Calvinistic provisionist approach. I love when folks come up with new terms because no one's ever really understood things as well as they have. Apart from God's gracious initiative in bringing his Son, the Holy Spirit, and the inspired gospel appeal. Notice there's nothing here about about grace. There's, there's nothing prevenient grace? No. He says he... So what is, what is grace? It's a gracious initiative. So in other words, God has provided graciously an initiative in the gospel. But you are capable in and of yourself, without prevenient grace, without regeneration, without any, I, I guess he would say there's some type of conviction of the Holy Spirit, but of course I would go, well, does the Holy Spirit convict everyone in the exact same way? If not, why not? What is the nature of conviction? Is, is Because I would recognize a restraining action of the Holy Spirit of God in convicting men, in reminding men there's going to be a judgment. I think there's been more than once that a person didn't pull a trigger because they feared eternity. That's not the same thing as conviction of sin under, under repentance and salvation. So what is, what is this role of the Spirit? Is, 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 is it equally done? To it would have to be equally done, because it couldn't, there can't be an elect people. There's no sovereign decree upon which to have the identity of the elect. The elect is filled by the, the autonomous actions of mankind. So, anyway... So that's what's gracious. The gracious initiative in bringing his son, the Holy Spirit, and the inspired gospel appeal. By the way, Pelagius would have agreed with all of that. No one can merit salvation or consistently seek to obey God in a way that will attain his own righteousness. So apart from God's gracious initiative in bringing his son, the Holy Spirit, and the inspired gospel appeal, no one can merit salvation or consistently seek to obey God in a way that will attain his own righteousness. So a provision has been made, but there is no necessity of a divine grace in the soul of the individual. That's Pelagius. That is Pelagius. That's 